Hello, I'm Elsa Pancharoli and you're listening to Paleocast. Racism extends its tendrils throughout the sciences. You could even say that Western science is built on it. The halls of universities and museums are lined with the portraits of wealthy white men and a few women who patronised them and filled their collections with specimens. As the geologist Chris Jackson said in a recent interview, that's the demographic that's controlled the narrative around science. And that's the demographic who's decided who gets in and who gets out and who gets heard. Professor Jackson is about to host the Royal Institution Christmas Lecture in the UK this year, and he'll be the first black person to do so in its entire 200 year history. What I'd like to do in this episode is approach the subject of race from the perspective of paleontology, and specifically the legacy of colonialism and slavery. Is paleontology racist? How should we as individuals act to address issues of race in our research? Who is responsible for addressing these issues in fossil collections? As paleontologists, many of us work on the fossil collections that were taken from indigenous lands without consultation, permission or acknowledgement. In the 18th and 19th century in particular, colonial attitudes towards people of non-European descent meant that their natural heritage was plundered and sent back to Europe and the United States to fill museum shelves. Researchers, including myself, continue to benefit from these resources. What should we do to address this? I'll speak to two experts who have explored the legacy of colonialism and paleontology, and I'll get their perspectives. In the first half of the episode, we'll look at the historical side of it with writer and historian of science, Christa Kuljian. She'll talk about some of the key paleontologists and anthropologists who are working in South Africa and the scientific narrative of human origins in particular. In the second half, we'll speak to Rob Theodore from the Sedgwick Museum of Earth Sciences in Cambridge about the way in which this history plays out in museum collections and what moves are being taken to decolonize museums and help researchers. This episode will include stories about historical colonial exploitation and racism that some listeners may find upsetting. South Africa has yielded some of the most important fossil material in the world. Major finds have included the near-complete fossils of synapsids and reptiles from the Permian and Triassic, and in other parts of the country, the geologically recent fossils of human ancestors and relatives that have also been discovered. The history of the collection of these fossils is inextricably tied to the history of colonisation. I'm speaking to someone who's spent a great deal of time studying and writing about the history of race and fossil collecting in South Africa and other parts of the continent. Krista Kuljian is based in Johannesburg and is a research associate at the University of Witwatersrand. Originally studying the history of science, she now focuses on narrative non-fiction and her recent book, Darwin's Hunch, is what we'll be talking about today. So hi, Krista, welcome uh, to Paleocast. Thank you very much for having me, Elsa. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I'd really love to talk to you about your work, but first, could I just ask you, how did you come to study the history of science? Well, I was an avid reader um, as, a, as a child, reading broadly and studied at school um, biology, uh, chemistry, physics. But I think it was a, a program I watched on the BBC, a documentary series called The Ascent of Man um, back in 1973 when I was 11, that kind of sparked my interest. It was a, a program um, that Jacob Bernowski uh, narrated about, he went around the world and, and looked at how the growth of science and art were important factors in, in human development. So I was really inspired by that and ended up um, deciding to, to study or take at least a course in the history of science at university and was convinced that's what I wanted to study. So I think what fascinated me most was the concept that science doesn't exist in a vacuum and that I was learning that science is 
molded by its its social and political context. So we were studying how British scientists in the 1800s, including Darwin, were shaped by the Victorian age and colonialism, and how science in the U.S. after World War II was shaped by the Cold War and McCarthyism and issues of scientific racism and, and sexism in um, science were, you know, were themes that kept coming up again and again. Hmm. Yeah, well, I can understand how that would have made you really want to pursue it. It's a really fascinating topic and uh, kind of endless. There's no end to where you can take it. Yes. Um, you, where is it you studied? What was your degree in history of science? Yes, um, I did um, a you know degree in the history of science. I, I studied with Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard in the early 1980s. Um, he had just published the Mismeasure of Man um, at that time. So, you know, in class we were talking about the history of eugenics, and and at the same time I studied with Ruth Hubbard, a professor of biology and. She was writing a lot about how male scientists um, had been um, looking at women's biology as inferior. And I ended up writing my thesis about um, how some of the scientific myths in the early part of the 20th century shaped choices open to women. So you wrote this book, Darwin's Hunch, which uh, I read. I thought it was absolutely amazing. Uh, Could you tell our listeners a little bit about what it's about? Yes. um, The title, Darwin's Hunch, refers to uh, Charles Darwin and his writing in The Descent of Man in 1871 that he believed that all humans had common origins in Africa. And at the time, many of his peers and other scientists um, in the UK and in Europe rejected that idea. They were really looking elsewhere. They were thinking that human origins could be found in Asia or in Europe, in the UK. So I really began my research um, looking at the history of science and race and human origins. And um, the book is about you know the last 150 years since Darwin's uh, idea Um, showing that the evidence has built up over time that, in fact, um, that he was correct and that um, the cradle of humankind, uh, or at least one of the cradles, is on the continent of Africa. So the book looks at three different time periods and how the social and and political context of the time uh, did shape the science of human origins and paleoanthropology and genetics. So the first part looks at the 1870s through to the 1940s when Raymond Dart and Robert Broom were active in the field. Um, Part two looks at the 1950s through the 1980s when Philip Tobias was a well-known figure uh, in paleoanthropology. And then part three looks at the late 1980s uh, through to the present, uh, which is really post-apartheid, uh, but also looking at how genetics has had an impact on um, thinking about human evolution. So, um, so it's really it's really looking at how the changing social and political context has shaped um, and interacted with the science over time. Um, there's some really interesting. Um, uh, stories, uh, especially about Raymond Dart. Um, can I perhaps share share one of them with you? Uh, yeah, please do. Um, I, I, I think that, especially given the pe- fact that um, you know your um, listeners are uh, in the field of paleontology, um, it's uh, it was really something for um, me to look into the archives. Um, because Raymond Dart is is known, you know, by many people in paleontology for um, his um, having described the Taum child skull um, and named it as Australopithecus africanus in 1925. 
Um, but I spent time in the DART archives at Bits University um, wanting to um, get a sense of, of um, Raymond DART's life. And I found a lot that I hadn't known about the fact that uh, DART also was very interested in researching living people. Um, he established a human skeleton collection at Witz University in the 1920s. He led a Witz expedition to the Kalahari in 1936. And he was interested in human anatomy. And as many scientists at the time um, put forward the concept of race typology. And race typology was the thinking that humans could be um, separated into pure and distinct racial types, which is, of course, not the case. Um, and that really drove his interest in race um, because he thought that it could provide a clue to human evolution. And, you know, in terms of looking at the context in which DART science took place, um, the social and political context at the time, um, really came from um, the view that um, most people in the world outside of Europe um, were seen as um, were seen as less evolved, less human than white Europeans. Many scientists used the word primitive. Scientists used the word living fossils to describe the indigenous people in southern Africa. So it was um, really my, my interest to, to look at that relationship between what was happening uh, socially and what was happening in science. I think that's a very uh, interesting um, segue into the next question I wanted to ask about um, Robert Broom. A lot of our listeners will have heard of Broom uh, through his work on synapsids and therapsids from South Africa. But you talked there about collecting the collecting of skeletons and uh, and these kind of uh, ideas about race. Could you talk a little bit more about where Robert Broom fits into this picture? Yes, um, Robert Broom was um, much older than Raymond Dart. He arrived in South Africa. He's um, Scottish originally, um, but he arrived in South Africa in the late eighteen um, hundreds. Um, many people know of his work in paleoanthropology supporting Raymond Dart. Um, he also described um, uh, ancient fossils that he found in the Sterkfontein Caves in South Africa as Australopithecus africanus. He was supportive of um, Raymond Dart. Um, uh, and he, but he also, um, what I think a lot of people don't know about Robert Broom isn't discussed as often, is that he was involved um, as a, a young person. Um, he was involved in the human skeleton trade, which was rife at the time, the end of the 1800s. He um, collected and sent human skulls off to William Turner at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and this was, this was part of a much larger human skeleton trade that was supporting these human skeleton collections that existed in the United States, in the UK, in Europe. It was not only in, in South Africa. Um, so, you know, Robert Broom's description, his own description of how he prepared those human skulls is really disturbing. Um, in Darwin's Hunch, I didn't shy away from that aspect of the history. Um, I drew on the one biography that was written about Robert Broom in 1972 by George Findlay. I drew on a book called Skeletons in the Cupboard about the um, human skeleton uh, trade written by Martin Legasik and Siraj Rasool. That was published in 2000. And I went into the Broom archives uh, in Pretoria and um, really, um, yeah, found many disturbing stories about how Robert Broom had um, collected uh, human skeletons and um, then sent them off to Europe um, and the UK for further analysis. 
Um, there's 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 another aspect of Robert Groom's um, role um, that I also wanted to highlight in, in Darwin's Hunch, um, and that's the fact that um, you know many black people um, who were active and supportive of um, scientists in paleoanthropology uh, never received acknowledgement for their work. So I tried to find out who worked with Robert Groom. Um, at Stair Clinton and Swart Cons that didn't get credit. Um, for example, Daniel Mosetle um, was with Broom uh, in 1947 uh, at Stair Clinton. Um, uh, another man, Saul Satole, was with Broom in the 1930s and went on to work at the Transvaal Museum for decades. And I'm excited because there's a new book coming out about Saul Satole. Uh, it's called The Forgotten Scientist by Lorato Troc. So I think that it's it's also very important to give attention to these hidden figures in history. Because these people very often were the, the key to finding specimens, weren't they? But they were rarely ever acknowledged. Is that right? Well, I think that, um, that uh, there are... Um, uh, many, many people in history um, who haven't been fully acknowledged. I mean, when you ask that question, it makes me think of Stephen Watsumi and Nkwane Molefe, who were really um, uh, critical to the finding of uh, the skeleton Littlefoot. This is much later now. We're talking um, in the late 1990s. Um, and because um, it was post-apartheid, there was a recognition of their role, and they were part of the press conference to announce the find. Um, however, they, um, they too did not have the opportunity in their lives to pursue their interest in science, to um, pursue um, you know, their education in science. So not only has there been a history of scientific racism, um, in the science itself, but there has been um, uh, racism in terms of the opportunities that have been able that have been open to to black people in the South African context. Hmm. So, what would you say to people who might argue that science and politics are really quite separate things? I mean, some people say that science is, a, you know, it's pure and it has nothing to do with people, and so you know we don't have to look at the backgrounds of the people who who did, you know, collected these objects and went to these places. What would you say to that? Right. Well, I would say that that scientists, as I said earlier, scientists are shaped by their social and political context. I, I don't think it's possible to uh, look at the science in isolation without looking at the scientist. And I think that we are all shaped by our assumptions and um, so to our scientists. So they're, they're, and their assumptions shape uh, research questions. So I would say to, to someone trying to make that argument that it's important for everyone to reflect on the influences around us and the assumptions that we take into our science. So, um, you know, for example, scientists have been influenced by the way that uh, their societies have viewed race and gender, uh, which in turn has influenced the way they have viewed the world and their science. So I, I like... Um, one particular example that perhaps could provide an illustration, um, one that I explore in Darwin's Hunch, and that is of Piltdown Man. Um, you and I have chatted about this before, that Piltdown Man was um, a series of ancient fossils uh, found in Sussex, England in 1912. And the thinking at the time about human origins was that Humans had their origins perhaps in Asia. Um, scientists were looking at the Neanderthal finds in France and Germany. And um, so when Piltdown Man was uh, um, presented in 1912, um, there was great excitement that perhaps this meant that humans had their origins in England. Um, and there was a national you know, um, pride about that. Um, but decades later, 
um, in the early 1950s, um, scientists viewed those, those fossils again and found out, in fact, that they weren't ancient at all, that they had been doctored modern bones. So, but what's so interesting is that British scientists, um, you know, for, for decades, really looked at Piltdown Man as guiding their thoughts about human evolution. Um, uh, the, um, the scientist um, Smith Woodward really spent his entire life looking at these fossils. He wrote a book called The Earliest, Earliest Englishman in 1948 about those fossils. Sir Arthur Keith had used Piltdown for 40 years as the foundation of his thinking. So, um, and it also had an impact on Raymond Dart. Um, scientists were not accepting his view of the Taung child skull as being um, uh, evidence of pre-human origins in Africa. So, you know, Piltdown Man really illustrates how false scientific data can be accepted quite easily when it fits within existing expectations. And that science expected, or scientists expected that humans evolved in Europe, so they more readily accepted the evidence. Um, so when false information is presented as fact, it can be welcomed because of assumptions that are incorrect. And certainly racist thinking at the start of the 20th century was a part of what created the environment in which a fallacious fossil find in England could be readily accepted. So do you think that looking at history in this way could end up demonizing some people who are really quite important? Well, I think that it's um, a, I, I think it's possible to look at people from history, important figures in history, more fully. I don't think that we have to view scientists from the past as either heroes or villains. I think that it's a problem if we view someone in isolation. Um, so looking at them with in you know context of their uh, their work their society is important um, so I think it's um, uh, that if we're you know we've been talking about South Africa but there are many you know scientists uh, internationally as well that it's important to look not only at their scientific contributions but the context in which that occurred so uh, Georges Cuvier in France, um, and you know his history in terms of um, viewing uh, black people, black bodies uh, as as specimens in the 1800s. Uh, Linnaeus and his um, uh, having named um, people from Southern Africa uh, in a very you know painful way and categorizing. Um, some humans as being part of a, another species. So I, I think that it's important to look at this history and learn from it, um, to be aware of the colonial history, to be aware of the history of scientific racism. I, I think that, you know, one example just by way of comparison is that, you know, people are looking at, at George Washington a uh, historic figure in the United States um, in new ways, engaging with the fact that he was a slave owner. Yes, he was the first president of the United States, um, but he also owned slaves and uh, new biographies are looking more closely at that, putting him in the context of um, the time of slavery. So I think it's important to address these difficult and painful histories rather than pretending that they didn't occur. So I, I think it's very important to review this history, review the curriculums that are being offered to students and in coursework. So I, I think that that's, uh, that's important for, um, for people in all disciplines. Well, as a researcher, um, approaching a collection, 
how should we deal with this kind of thing? Do you think that we should, for example, refuse to work with specimens if we know that they were collected, um, you know, in some extremely bad circumstances? You know, how are there other ways that we might approach the historical context of, of the objects that we are studying? Right. I think that's a very important question. I think that all institutions, uh, universities, museums, need to reflect on their history and the history of their collections and how they were collected. I mean, we've been talking about fossils, but, um, you know, we need to talk about human remains, artwork, heritage was stolen from Africa. Um, it's, it, this is a major area of scholarship and activism today. Um, so I, I, I believe it's important for institutions a, across the world not just in South Africa, certainly in Europe, the UK, the United States, Australia. And um, this is, uh, you know, relevant to collectors even prior to Broom, um, you know, who traveled the world and sent, uh, in many occasions, stolen items back to museums of natural history in, in Britain and Europe and the US. And so each institution needs to promote programs of review and restitution. So I, I don't think it only sits with the individual researcher. I think that this is an issue that sits, um, you know, with the larger um, institutions um, and uh, more broadly in society. Um, you, you were asking about the way that researchers do their work in relation to, you know, their fossil specimens, but I'd like to raise um, the fact that researchers can also reflect on the way that they conduct their research more broadly, because there is a legacy of colonial patterns of research. Um, researchers arrive in Southern Africa or East Africa from, from the UK or Europe or the US, and they're often under pressure to conduct their research and then get back home. Um, and oftentimes, I think um, there's a need for a more collaborative approach, different model of research that engages uh, more vigorously with local students and local researchers. I think this is something that funding bodies um, need to think through as they're providing funding for researchers, something that universities need to support in terms of uh, giving researchers uh, more time to have that kind of more collaborative approach with local institutions. Um, so I think it's an important question to ask, you know, how often do visiting researchers, you know, spend that time that's needed on the ground? So th this is part of what we mean when we talk about decolonizing the paleosciences. It's interesting that you bring up current practice because I think that was that was really um, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you was um, these these sort of racist ideas about evolution and, and attitudes towards indigenous people and their lands has all of it gone away is is this subject that we are talking about do you think that this is really just in the realms of history? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, there is definitely a, a legacy um, of um, colonial racism that shapes and affects the paleosciences today. Um, and in fact, I was very interested to see that the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology put out a statement in the middle of June, um, I think in the wake of Black Lives Matter um, in the U.S., and that statement said, let's see, paleontology as a science is not divorced from racism and colonialism. And in the statement, they mentioned the theft of and experimentation on black bodies. They mentioned removing fossils from colonies without crediting indigenous discoverers. Um, they talk about working to support black colleagues in the field um, that have often been marginalized. So these are very much issues today. So I don't see this as being only a matter of history at all. It's very current. It's very relevant to work 
um, and research in 2020 and in the future. Well, speaking to you and also the statement that you just brought up made by SVP and, and the similar statements from other organisations, they do make you feel positive that we are addressing these issues. But uh, would you say there's probably quite a long way still to go, isn't there? Absolutely, Elsa. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done um, in in um, looking at uh, uh, scientific racism historically, at looking at the field um, and where it needs to, to head in the future. Yes, but I, I think it's um, that there is um, certainly hope for the future, certainly in, in South Africa in the field of paleoanthropology, there are a growing number of young black students entering the field. Um, there was a session in August uh, hosted by the University of Johannesburg on black women in the paleo sciences, providing um, inspiration and guidance to um, new students entering the field. So I think that things are changing very, very slowly, um, but there is a reason to be uh, encouraged. And, and, and I would encourage, um, yeah, a lot of young people in South Africa to, to enter this field and, and help shape its future. Well, Krista, thank you so much for speaking to us and telling us about your, your research and talking about this subject. Thank you so much for having me, Elsa. The kinds of specimens collected by Robert Broom and others in South Africa were shipped to museums in the Western world to fill their shelves. But not only from South Africa, but the rest of the continent of Africa and of Australia, South America, Asia, wherever there were colonies, there were collectors. In Europe and the United States, as well as in museums in these former colonies, we now benefit from these collections as members of the public and as researchers. This poses a moral dilemma for all of us. How do we deal with the colonial past in our museum collections and our research? Well, to talk about this, um, I have with me Rob Theodore, who is Exhibitions and Displays Coordinator for the Sedgwick Museum of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Welcome to Paleocast, Rob. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. So, uh, yeah, if it's OK, could we start off by maybe, would you mind telling our listeners who you are, like a little bit about yourself? What's your background and what's your job? Sure. So um, uh, I'm Rob Theodore. Uh, yep. As you said, I'm the Exhibitions and Display Coordinator at the Cedric Museum. Um, I have been interested in, in paleontology and, and natural sciences and, since I was four, and I kind of never lost that passion. Uh, I studied paleobiology and evolution at uh, Portsmouth, and then I did a museum studies master's degree uh, straight afterwards. Then I fell into a six-month uh, cataloging contract at the Cedric Museum, and I never left. <laughs> so I've been <laughs> 13 years now, um, doing various jobs, um, sort of um, shifting between collections, then to sort of collections. Um, I even looked after the Min and Pet collections for a little while, um, sort of uh, in an interim sort of patch. And then, yeah, got into exhibitions, display side of things. And yeah, that's that's kind of my sort of background, sort of job wise. So on a day to day basis, what kind of stuff do you get up to? Oh, so <laughs> I do everything here. It, it's um, <laughs> so the the museum is is a little bit different to to a lot of other museums in the way that sort of there isn't a big distinction between sort of that front of house and back of house sort of classic sort of split. So my my office opens onto the the galleries like everyone else's, and through throughout the day we'll we'll be chatting to visitors. Um, we'll be you know looking after the toilets sometimes. We'll be um, uh, checking our emails. <laughs> we'll be <laughs> sort of doing sort of everything. Um, a lot of my my job at the moment is is around sort of online exhibitions, obviously from home. Um, but before that, I was doing a big sort of research uh, display with uh, some folks who look at the, the deep earth, uh, some, a research group in the, at the university, and sort of turning their sort of research into a 
museum exhibition and online uh, sort of resources and uh, working with some other colleagues in the in the museum on on outreach uh, public engagement sort of in general mm. and that's that's really great I've been doing that it's kind of a big part of why my role was kind of created was to 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 work on the the, the research um the the uh, impact to pathways to impact in the in the in the department and, and pulling that research into into the the museum and then the other half of my big half of my job is, is sort of community sort of uh, public engagement so I um, started a community cabinet where I sort of chat to folks in the in the galleries and and do a little bit of promotion online and try and get their their collections into the museum and sort of put them next to these these old um, uh, historical collections by um, 19th century famous geologists and paleontologists and give them the same sort of weight um, having them in the same cases having the same sort of um, you know not hiding them in a, in a different part of the museum or, or keeping them separate or sort of keeping them in the same place and and going through the same sort of exhibition process that I would go with uh, a researcher or an artist or uh, anyone like that and really sort of doing the same thing treating everyone the, sort of the same way and, and really sort of fostering a relationship with those with people in the community who love museums and love geology and paleontology and um, maybe might want to get into a job or, or be more involved in the in the museum in the future. Oh, as if uh, you suggesting there's people who don't love museums. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, so, well, the Cedric's is quite an old museum, isn't it? Can, can you tell us a bit about its history and who who is this Sedgwick person for those who don't know? <laughs> sure. So the Sedgwick Museum is um, the oldest of the Cambridge University museums, and the oldest intact um, geology collection in the in the Western sort of Western world. That's that's oh, what wow. we're sort of chatting about. So it was founded by a, a, a man called John Woodwards uh, in 1728. He was a kind of a one of those folks from the 1700s who sort of had a bit of a hand in everything sort of was interested in 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 science and just kind of in sort of politics and just just everything really um he was a bit of a bit of a character by by all accounts um i think he challenged someone to a duel in london um <laughs> he was that kind of person i think he he rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way um but um the the collection was kind of built um, on this idea that um, the natural world could be could be used that things from the natural world could be used and, and looked at and to to understand it rather than um, museums at the time collections at the time were being these uh, cabinets of cabinet, cabinets of curiosities oh, which yeah. are kind of these these very um, ornate very showy offy things from from the, the the furthest corners of the world that are big and impressive and and they were just for folks to share with with other folks who uh, have their own cabinets basically so you could compare and, and uh, um, discuss each other's behind their backs and things um so Woodward's collection Woodward's collection is very um not that basically it's it's lots of small things from from around from around the world that are are there to look at and to, to study and, and compare, um, contrast against each other and try and work out what was going on um, in the world. And there's, there's there's not just fossils in there, there's rocks, there's ethnographic objects, a few of them, and um, some other sort of um, you know, archaeological artefacts as well. So um, very much a we, research collection. Yes, very much. And the... Um, uh, uh, a big part of um, sort of Woodward's sort of ideas was he he, he wanted to try and understand what, what fossils were. Um, that the that sort of, there were ideas that these these rocks that looked like living things had sort of just grown in the ground, um, and just happened to be the same shape as um, living things. And and he's he has um, one of the good examples is he has some shark's teeth. Um, some modern sharks, teeth, and here's some fossil ones in the, in the collection as well. And he was using this sort of um, 
compare and say, look, these are the, the same same things, just these other ones have turned to stone. Um, and he acquired the collection of a, a chap called Ag- Agostino Schiller, um, who um, was also thinking along the same lines. He's an amazing illustrator, and so he was drawing and, and comparing these these things in his in his sort of book he'd, he'd written beforehand. And he was coming up with some ideas, some very sort of um, ideas, sort of rooted in in religion, rooted in Christianity, because um, obviously that was that was kind of the overarching thing at the time. It wasn't, um, you know, Charles Darwin hadn't come along yet. So they were trying to explain um, the layers of rocks and how different fossils were, were um, formed um, through the story of, of um, through the sort of Bible and Christianity. So there were their ideas that um, the rocks and, and the different fossils were settling out because of density and um, it, it all happened during the Great Floods. Um, so there's lots of ideas um around that through the through the church and through through Christianity. So there was about 10,000 objects in this collection that was donated to the uh, museum, to, to the university, uh, with some money for a sort of a professorship, someone to, to, to look after the, the objects. Uh, and Adam Sedgwick was uh, one of those, sort of uh, about 100 years later, he, he became Woodwardian professor and he really took on the, the the job, really sort of, really you know, pushed on this collection from from the ten thousand sort of objects that started to about half a million by the time he he passed away. Um, so he he was kind of really important in, in building up this collection and and his networks, his his um, his kind of connections around around the UK and Europe, and um, really helped sort of build up this collection and, and his he wanted to to really teach geology in in Cambridge which wasn't part of the 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 sort of subjects they were teaching at the time so he was really doing a, a big job on that and then after he passed away the collections were too big to to keep in in the the various rooms in in the university so they they built a, a memorial museum here um, in on Downing Street that opened in 1904 uh, to house the collections. So uh, that's that's really interesting what you said there about um, how the collection was put together, because I think, you know, when we chatted before, you mentioned how a lot of collections in, in all museums, as well as your own, they're often influenced by who it was that put them together in the first place as to what's actually in the collection. So what kind of stuff, you've mentioned a lot of rocks that Woodward uh, was particularly interested in. What kind of other stuff do you have in the collections at the Sedgwick? So the collection is that the majority of them is, is, is it's a, a fossil museum, a paleontology museum. Uh, there was a separate um, Min and Pet Museum um, in the in the university, uh, minerals and uh, petrology, so rocks and minerals, and um, they were taught separately. They were they were sort of separate departments in a way. Uh, so there was a, a mineralogy museum, and their collections uh, were sort of acquired through the university, but in different ways to sort of the the paleontology collections. Then the collections and the departments were all merged together in the 80s. Um, and the, the museum 19, has... Is that the 1980s? 1980s. Yeah. yeah 1980s. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the museum galleries are primarily um, paleontology. They're, they're laid out in a stratigraphic um, sort of sequence. And then sort of in the late... In the in the late eighties and early nineties, they started to to try and uh, find spaces to put sort of rock and and, and mineral uh, displays in. Um, so the museum and and collections are the majority is, is paleontology, but we have rocks, minerals, um, and a big archive as well. We shouldn't forget about the archive, which hasn't really been looked at until I think maybe eight nine years ago when we 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 had a our first sort of. A uh, professional archivist employed to to start organising that and and start really sort of 
learning what we have sort of paper wise and uh, and all of the records that, that go with a lot of the the specimens we have and you have quite a lot of British material don't you but what yes. do you have what do you have things from abroad as well so the the collections are are mostly European and so the, the paleontology collections particularly they're, they're, they're sort of showing a a European stratigraphy, but we do have things from the US. Um, we have some, a few things from from Africa, uh, uh, and so, some some major collections from from India as well. We have in the paleontology sort of section. Uh, the Min and Peck collections are from all over the world, and I forgot to mention we have a Building Stones collection as well, which is. Mm. Um, mostly um british and uh sort of british colonies um yeah, that was that was uh sorted out and put in the museum in the in the early 1900s um so we have a very extensive and, and very well organized building stones collection as well so um that's a it's a a treasure trove of, of information and um I think we'll talk about that a bit later on when it comes to the, the decolonizing stuff. Yeah, well, that's that's a perfect segue to my next question, actually, was, you know, I know that you've been involved quite a lot in the decolonization project at the Sedgwick. So decolonization is obviously a really major issue for museums around the world over the last few years. But I wondered, could you maybe tell me what, what does it actually mean? Uh, what does it involve? doing in the museums uh so a large part of it is is the the display side um it's um sharing the the, the information about about collections and and about um objects that have come from um former colonies and and british colony and european colonies in general and just giving more context to them and um our museum in particular has been very sort of focused on the science and there are there's a lot more information and, and important information that we should share about how how these uh, objects ended up in the museum and where they've come from and what was happening um, in a broader sort of political and uh, geographical climate rather than just focusing on the science. And so, we're, um... and, sorry, go on. No, no, uh, it's, that's fine. I was going to actually, I was thinking about your iguanodon, in, uh, mm. which of course you're really famous for. It's such a sort of stunning thing to see when you walk in the door. Um, but it's got a bit of a sort of connection to some really unpleasant past, doesn't it? Can you tell me a bit about that? It has. It's, um, uh, it was donated by um, uh, King Leopold II of Belgium. And... Um, for anyone who's sort of not aware of King Leopold II of Belgium, he um, he was a complex man who ended up taking over a very large part of Africa for himself, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, in the scramble for Africa at the end of the 1800s when the European um, powers, in a way, were, were divvying up Africa for themselves after they got rid of the... Um, Arab and African slave traders um, for for sort of resources. They, they, they were keen on, on exploiting Africa for the untapped wealth that, that they have. Uh, so King Leopold um, managed to, to acquire the Democratic Republic of Congo, this, this area of Central Africa, for himself. It wasn't for Belgium. It was his own sort of personal... Um, venture and it was sort of agreed with with the other sort of European nations as as a it was a sort of a humanitarian mission it was to to help help the the people in in the Democratic Republic of Congo or what would become the Democratic Republic of Congo um, help civilize them bring bring Christianity to them look after them and bring them bring them into sort of Western standards, I guess. Um, but he was actually exploiting the country for its resources um, secretly, semi-secretly. Um, there were uh, 
uh, he was he, sort of pulling up, uh, there was huge rubber plantations there and uh, slavery had been abolished, but he was, it was virtually uh, slave labor. He was, he was using the, the, the people from the Democratic Republic of Congo and he was, um, there were some really sort of nasty, nasty sort of working regimes and, and punishments. And it was, it was really dreadful what he was, he was doing there. And it was keeping it quiet. Um, but there were, there were sort of talk of, of things happening there and, and his, his reputation had started to sort of sour in the, in the late, very late 1890s. Um, he was under a lot more scrutiny. Um, and that's when we acquired this, this Iguanodon, which um, the Natural History Museum also has a cast of, and Oxford's, and I think several other um, large museums in, in Europe. And um, it's interesting why, why we got this, this wonderful cast um, at the same time that uh, King Leopold was maybe struggling a little bit um, with his reputation and at the same time he was uh really sort of pushing this cultural side of things he was uh constructing a museum in belgium uh the museum of central africa as kind of a, a showcase of his his humanitarian work in in the congo and um that has its own very difficult history i'd, I'd um, suggest people go and read a lot about that but um, he had a he had a brought over about two hundred um, people from the Democratic Republic of Congo and had them outside the museum, sort of reenacting their life um, as part of this this um, this museum uh, in a way. Um, uh, so, and I think a lot of them had had, had died and, and are buried just outside the museum, which are you know, very very difficult things. It's really interesting because you would, you can see how you would think something like an iguanodon cast. How could that possibly have any, you know, any connections that would need to be explored? But as you you're saying this, so he he gave it to the museum, didn't he? As basically a, like, I can't be a bad guy because look, I'm giving you an iguanodon, <laughs> as if anybody who gives a, an iguanodon can't possibly be bad. <laughs> so it was to the university. So we weren't uh, the Cedric wasn't. Um didn't exactly exist at the time. So zoology um, were keeping it first and we, we sort of have a bit of a joke that zoology might want it back at any time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but there wasn't room um, for zoology to sort of keep it and this new museum here was being built. So um, that ended up being kind of a centrepiece to the the new museum. Yeah. And yeah, so this, this I mean, this this is... Um, for anyone who knows the sort of scientific history of, of these these specimens, it, they were pretty pretty big deal when they were discovered. Not not long before, so there's a there's a big sort of um, side of things that this is a really really important scientific discovery. These these complete dinosaur skeletons um, in Belgium, and this this was one of the first sort of complete mounted skeletons that had, had been had been found and, and, and put on display. So there was a lot, you know, there's reasons why sort of these, these large um, institutions would want a cast of the skeleton. But um, yeah, for it to be sort of donated at, at that time was, there, there's, there's other bits and bobs going on there, I think. So the kind of connections that you're making as part of a decolonization project, they don't all necessarily have to be completely direct, do they? It's not necessarily that the specimen itself directly came from a, a former colony. It can be like the Iguanodon, where it's like somebody who they, the person who donated it, has the connection. But that's still part of the process, isn't it, of decolonizing your museum? That's that's correct. Um, with our paleo collections in in particular that there isn't from what we've sort of i mean we've only started scratching the surface with our with our collections um in terms of their links but the the paleo collection is mostly european so we'll be looking a lot at the collectors and and what their sort of what their um 
what their lives were like, what what they were doing, what they were up to, and and how there might be some links, whether whether it's it's through their um, their beliefs or their we we, we know that um, some quite high profile paleontologists, geologists had, had owned slaves. Um, so we'll be we'll be looking into into our connections, into our collectors lists, and and seeing where there might be that kind of link. And um, then we have the Min and Pet collections, which um, we might find some sort of more direct links to to the slave trade and and to um, to former colonies. So uh, in this process, I'm assuming that there's going to be kind of almost two halves to what you need to do. There's the public facing side of the information you're going to present, but there's also going to be this back back uh, stage for the, for the researchers, for the museum curators. So could we maybe talk a bit first about that public side? What sort of things might change in the museum over the next few years as you begin this process in terms of the displays? Well, um be doing our best to, to put all of the, the information we, we find um, as publicly as possible, whether it's in the galleries or, or online or, or both. We'll, we'll be sharing sharing that information. Um, it's really important to um, to balance the, the sort of that scientific knowledge with with the, the context, the, the 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 political context, and the and you know the links to to the, to the colonies and you know the the empires that um, the museum has been built on. Basically, it's, it's I think it's it's a much more structural thing, and we we need to sort of acknowledge that the museum and and very clearly through our labelling and, and interpretation that that the museum has been built on on sort of the legacies of empire basically. Mm. So we'll, we'll be we'll be putting in labels where we can. Um, I hope we can can get some some more diverse points of view. Um, that's another sort of side of decolonizing de- decolonizing a, a museum is to um, go beyond the the voices that are um, traditionally able to to interpret and write about the collections and, and share the information about the collections. That's curators and um, sort of collection staff and and people like me in exhibitions display sort of sides of things and and opening it up to more um diverse interpretations and and um linking them to the to the those other stories the 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 stories we have about um the empires that maybe we we as scientists don't quite know very much about um it's sharing sharing the 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 authority on the narrative it's, it's letting letting more people in to talk about our, our collections yeah uh, so that kind of leads me to the second part of that which is uh you know i was i was wondering about where the how as researchers do we access this kind of information to know about what we're working on and so I guess that leads me to the second half of that question which is what kind of things are being done behind the scenes for uh, researchers who might be accessing your stuff and working on it so we're um we're going to make sure that that information is again as public as possible it's it's that word public is not just for our visitors in terms of coming to to see fossils on a on a day out it's it's everybody it's uh, researchers, its stakeholders, its other museums, um, it's, it's sort of core to what we we want to do is make sure everybody knows knows this information as much as we can, um, and part of that will be pulling in other other people to to come and research the collection so that we can share that with um, in a way the more traditional researchers on our collections. Um, I think that's a mindset that we need to sort of get our heads into is, is looking at remembering our, our collection is not, is a paleo collection or is an earth science collection, but it's not just earth sciences, uh, researchers, academics who would be interested in research in our collections. And then we have to look, um, look at our database, look at, look at the, the way we're storing our information, what information we record. And that's, 
that's a tricky subject because um, obviously it's um, we're looking at keeping historical data, but it, it's not very helpful when we want to maybe have a researcher in who wants to 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 understand the colonial history of a, a collector or a collection or a, a set of objects. Um, that stuff doesn't tend to be recorded that way historically. So it, it, it's it's sort of, we're learning and, and museums, a lot of museums have the same sort of um, challenge to, to try and uh, get that sort of information into their database, into their databases and um, able to share in, in that sort of way, rather than it kind of being, we know this stuff is from a certain place, but we haven't got it in a searchable uh, recorded way. So ultimately, do you think when when we as researchers are working on material that might have, um, you know, some kind of difficult uh, history to it, do you think, whose responsibility do you think it is to address that? Do you think it's ours as researchers or, or who should take responsibility for that? It, it's it's a joint thing. It's, it's um, the, the museums are, are, are doing work to decolonize their their material their their, their information their, their their systems but as a research community um there should be their own sort of ways of doing that so it's kind of a joint thing to try and remember that this stuff um is there um that this conversation about there might be some some difficult histories some some information that that might might be sensitive or there might be some uh some challenges around the the work and and objects that are, are being looked at and it's it's for everybody to understand that there might be a little bit that needs to be looked at so a researcher could come and say i'm looking at this stuff from from a a country you know an african country is there anything i should know about this this collection in terms of its colonial history or collectors um, or I'm looking at um, a collection that was picked up in uh, or you know donated in in the early 1800s um, what, what what could I be looking for here and then the museum might be able to say something um, there or we'll work together to, to do some research and 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 find out if there's anything that that might need need to be addressed as part of the the project. So I guess it kind of goes both ways, doesn't it? Like the researchers should be thinking to ask, um, but you know, museums also need to collect that data, like you were saying, and actually have that That's information. It. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And I suppose it would also be helpful if a researcher was to visit a collection and there was no mention of this kind of thing, and they know about it already, that they should maybe bring it up with the museum they're visiting. Do you think? And tell them. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's it's that kind of that that working together, sort of sharing information. Um, it only only helps, only benefits um, everybody and and the the sector in general. Um, the more we know, the more we learn. So one of the things you mentioned there was the legacy of slavery, um, and am I right in thinking that Cambridge has got a legacy of slavery project? Is that right? That's right. the The university is is looking into. Um, into its links with uh, the slave trade and just legacies of slavery and, and coerced um, working and and uh, all of that kind of those connections and the museums all of the museums in in Cambridge the uh, the UCM consortium are kind of at the forefront of that we're we're doing um, a lot of work and and we'll be working with the the new members of staff who are um, coming in to help with the research and really sort of. Can, you know, work on that, this project. We will be working with them very closely, um, sharing what we know, giving them um, sort of direction uh, and hoping that they will really sort of support us, um, pull out these stories, um, this information. And, and then in two years time, we'll be having a, a big exhibition uh, of objects and, and, and what we found out from from this this very it's a two-year project um but it's it's kind of a dipping the toes in type thing going to try and find out as much as we can but it's not going to be everything in two years so i think that's that's a very important thing to realize it's going to be sort of a 
a, a, a springboard for us to really sort of try and embed this this stuff into our museums and and after the project's done sort of really um i hope look at this kind of thing as as normal part of our, our work um, rather than it sort of being a new thing that we we have to think about a lot it's going to be something that we comes a bit more automatically to us when we're when we're doing projects in the future and 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 talking to each other and, and talking to researchers and um, thinking about how we go forward. So really looking forward to it. It's going to be good. Yeah, in terms of some of the kind of connections that you might be bringing up and exploring, um, I understand that Sedgwick himself was a trustee. Is that right of a slave owner? Is there a that's, connection? That's correct. There? That's mm. that's uh, that's that's one of our um, sort of big big. Um, things we'd like to to have a lot more investigation around. So Cedric was a trustee to a a lady called Anne Sill, um, who had inherited a, a plantation in in Jamaica, and she died before she could receive her her money from from compensation after the the abolition of slavery. And Cedric was a co trustee, so he and another man received um, some monies um, as the compensation and and there's there's a lot of we're, we're looking just at the moment now we're, we're going to try and, and, and work out um, what Cedric's spending was like um, after he, he received this money and, and see if it contributed to uh, the museum in any way see if we can identify any any particular specimens any particular collections or, or or field trips that he might have uh, used that money on. We know he was happy with receiving the money, despite um, being uh, quite anti-slavery in, in, in his writings. Because he was, consi- he was considered to be an abolitionist, wasn't he? That's right, yeah. But um, you mentioned that that maybe isn't quite as clear-cut as it sounds. Is that right? There's again at the, at the time he's I think he's he's it's going to sort of be paraphrasing a little bit but I think he's he says he's when he receives the money that he is um, happy to be um, um, properly paid for once <laughs> so I think he was oh. very pleased with, with that and um, our director Liz Hyde has been looking at um, what was happening in so Adam Cedric is from Dent in in Yorkshire and there was um, there might have been um, a small sort of slave community there um, or former slave community there. And and so Cedric was probably very aware of of this. Um, So there's, there's, there's lots of little blurry lines um, around what, what might have been happening there and and how, how he might have been supporting the the abolition of of slavery. Um, I've been doing a little bit of reading the the sort of there's a so Adam Cedric was a was a part of the clergy and there's there's ideas around sort of um the church wanting sort of the abolition of slavery to 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 help open up sort of uh religious um kind of support um sort of sort of sharing Christianity with with former slaves um so that that's a, an interesting little um little side that i've i've found that i'm hoping that that the, we'll be able to sort of follow up and, and see what was going on there yeah that'll be really interesting to know more about because uh, another really famous thing that you have in the collection is uh the picture by dilla Besh that he painted to raise money for mary anning is that right can you tell them we more? have yeah we have a copy of um jury antiqua um which was painted for sedgwick for his teaching but we have um specimens collected by mary anning which adam sedgwick bought and so this this painting was is a replica of or kind of a teaching version of a, a painting by henry de la Beche, uh, a watercolor 
Who, this is the one that's he, quite it's quite famous, isn't it, for having um, yes. like like pterosaurs pooping into the sea and things like yeah. that, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah, quite yeah. A... some very strange looking ammonites and, and things. <laughs> um, so so Delabesh and, and Mary Anning were, were quite close. De- Delabesh was a, a, a big supporter of Mary Anning. And she was in particularly hard financial times when Delabesh painted this this picture based on his her findings um her discoveries and he was printing them and selling them and the the proceeds were going to to marry and he was only able to do this really because he was getting a, a very good income from uh, a sugar plantation in jamaica which mm. he had inherited from from his father so um, and he, Delabesh had some some tough um, financial times after the uh, sort of he he had to um, in a way give up his his plantation. So this kind again it's kind of a um, not a direct link, but sort of Mary Anning sort of was getting support sort of indirectly through through the slave trade through through plantations in Jamaica. So um, that's something else we really want to to have a look at and and how Sedgwick and, and Mary Anning's connection, the specimens he was buying, um, how how those maybe link into to that bigger picture as well. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. I, I guess the sort of final question I would bring to you is, is you know, sometimes when people have discussions about decolonization and also about addressing the legacy of slavery, um, and, and things like this, there are some people who are quite resistant to that conversation, isn't there? Um, who maybe find it uncomfortable or think it's unnecessary in some cases. I just wondered what your reaction to that was. Uh, you know, how what what would you say to somebody who maybe who said that to you? Um, I would say that our objects are are. Our museum objects are are not just there f- for the scientific value. They 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 are they have a whole history as objects, and they can tell a lot more about what was going on. And there's a lot more that that is wrapped up inside them than than just the science that we that we want to share. And that it's important that we tell all of the stories, whether they're a bit uncomfortable or difficult or maybe you feel a bit embarrassed about them that they're all part of what has happened and it's important to be very sort of transparent and and honest um about about what you know where where the museum has come from Uh, i think it's as fundamental as that um this museum wouldn't wouldn't exist without um the slave trade it wouldn't exist without sort of the 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 colonization of um of africa and india it the, this this the whole environment is w- was right for this kind of museum to to appear the whole idea of science in a way which sort of dismisses a lot of um a lot of religious things and a lot of other interpretations maybe of objects um from other parts of the world um it's sort of it it's kind of a blanket over that those those are the ways of looking at at the world ways of looking at, at objects and part of the, you know that the whole sort of decolonization process is to say that we don't have to we, we should talk about all of these different ways of, of interpreting objects and all of the histories rather than just a very um narrow narrow view we don't have to we don't have to just do the the one narrow view we can do everything well rob it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and hearing about what you're doing at the museum to tackle decolonization and the legacy of slavery and all these these different issues um yeah it's been really interesting hearing your perspective and i'm really looking forward to seeing how this is going to change not just the sedgwick but i think museums in general i think it's going to be really interesting in the next five to ten years to see how people deal with this yeah, thank you for having me um i'm also quite excited to see how uh, how things go with museums and uh 
yeah just in generally i think there's 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 lots of lots of different strands of society looking at, at this kind of thing now and it's it's well overdue um but it's important that we start now rather than uh, wait till tomorrow so yeah yeah i'll see you in the sedgwick sometime Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider donating and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.